Welcome to ASRS's Journal of Vitreoretinal Diseases Authors Forum. I'm your host, Dr. Timothy Murray, Editor-in-Chief of JVRD. On each episode of the JVRD Authors Forum, I will interview innovative retinal researchers on their studies featured only in JVRD and how these studies will impact our patients' care in our clinics. Tune in to hear directly from investigators about the clinical implications of the newest and highest quality research in the field of retina. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Sharon Fekrat from Duke University to talk with us today about her manuscript on asymmetric perture-like retinopathy caused by a hypertensive emergency and undiagnosed type 2 diabetes. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you for having me. So Sharon, I I love that JVRD has been able to be aggressive about including case reports because so much of what we see in a case report translates to other aspects of our practice or things that highlight advantages. So tell me what struck you with this patient um, as being unique and, and what did you do to establish the diagnosis and manage her? Yeah, so this uh, gentleman, this case was very, very unique, actually. And there were several lessons that we learned from it. Um, You know, he came in, he was 29 years old. He was sent to the Duke emergency room. Uh, He's obese. And he had 10 days of decreased vision in his left eye. And that's really important because that eye had floaters. They sent him in emergently. He was had absolutely no history of trauma. He was 20-25 in the right eye, hand motions in the left. And he was seen by one of our residents first. Actually, he was seen by Ricky Woodward. Um, and he was really astute uh, in dilating him, working him up, and then giving me a call. And so what did he do before he gave you a call to know to call you? Yeah, well, he uh, dilated the patient uh, after... He checked the vision and looking back in the left eye, which is the eye that had the symptoms, right, of the floaters, he saw a vitreous hemorrhage. He saw a little bit of lipid in the background, some intraretinal hemorrhage. And he thought, well, could it be a retinal break? Let's do a, you know, depressed exam. What else could be going on? And a key lesson here is always examine the fellow eye. Because the fellow eye, the right eye, was 2025, and you know sometimes when a patient comes in urgently, you just examine one eye, right? The one with the with the symptoms. So Sharon, I think that's such an important point to make is that I think you and I are true believers that you, for me at least, I never look at one eye. It is always looking at both. And when I image, I routinely image both eyes because in many ways, as you've noted, that second eye is going to be the eye that gives you the biggest clue often to what's going on. That is so true. And I, in addition to examining both eyes, I also look at the cornea. (laughs) Now, this patient came through the emergency room, so I'm assuming that they had vitals and also maybe some blood work. Was that helpful? It sure was helpful. You know, a 29-year-old, you may not think necessarily that they could have hypertension or really anything else necessarily going on. But because this patient came through the emergency room, he had his blood pressure checked. And it was 226 over 125. Um, he had a, he was overweight, obese. He had a BMI of 34. And so the first thing going through everyone's mind is, could this be hypertensive retinopathy. Um, But there was a clue that sort of, um, you know, gave it away that perhaps it wasn't. And so take me through that clue and and how you evaluated that. How many times have we seen Percher's retinopathy, right? I think maybe one in a career, two in a career. Um, So it was very clever that Ricky said, I think this right eye, actually the eye that was 2025, the the eye that he wasn't set in for, um, had percher flecken. And, you know, sometimes it can be really difficult to differentiate that from cotton wool spots, right? Um, So, you know, hypertensive retinopathy, it was malignant hypertension. You know, we usually expect to see disc edema, um, 
you know, widespread, not just in the posterior pole, fundus findings. Um, but this was concentrated in the posterior pole of the asymptomatic eye. Um, so, you know, he was really clever. We discussed the differences between um, cotton wool spots and Percher Flecken, uh, which I now can spell. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, cotton wool spots have kind of indistinct borders. They um, are in the retinal nerve fiber layer. They block the underlying retinal vessels, whereas Percher Flecken are more distinct and they actually are perivascular. So they're around and they kind of hug the blood vessels, um, particularly the arteries. Um, and don't obscure the underlying vessels. So what an unusual presentation and what a highlight of why the second eye is so important. So you've, you've worked your differential diagnosis. How did you then decide to manage this patient? Well, um, right before that, you know, fortunately he came into the emergency room. Um, they did some basic labs and they found that he was very hyperglycemic. And so we eventually found that his A1C was almost 12. So he had not only malignant hypertension, but he also had absolutely uncontrolled uh, diabetes. And so first things first, right? So we had to, um, he was admitted to the hospital. They gave him a beta blocker to slowly start to bring down his blood pressure. And they had to get his diabetes under control as well. So we felt that by controlling these two systemic conditions, right, two causes of Percher-like retinopathy would then help um, his fundus appearance and his um, symptoms. Now, what kind of got us discussing this case a little bit is he had a vitreous hemorrhage in his left eye, the eye that he came in with the floaters. And so we were trying to think about how um, Percher-like retinopathy could contribute to a vitreous hemorrhage other than maybe breakthrough bleeding. Um, so it turns out ultimately that he had proliferative diabetic retinopathy in his left eye, which is what brought all of this to our attention. So now that you've got him admitted, were you thinking about urgent um, anti-VEGF therapy, urgent secondary vitrectomy. I mean, what, what is your thought for, a, you know, this yes. sort of severely ill patient? Well, um, you know, his right eye was 2025. And so, um, and the OCT, other than showing some interretinal lipid and also some PAM in the inner retina, um, we decided the left eye had a mildish vitreous hemorrhage that was concentrated over the macula. That's why he was hand motion. Um, but we ended up giving him intravitreal anti-VEGF, um, bevacizumab, which um, led to improvement in the vitreous hemorrhage over the ensuing weeks. And it's interesting, too, that we do simple things like elevate the head of the bed and, and try to get the patient to have clearance and functional vision restoration so we can decide if we need to operate and when we need to operate. Exactly. You know, he was um, he had good vision in his right eye, so there wasn't really anything pushing us. Um, we did do B-scan um, echography and we could see that the retina was attached. We could see the periphery well enough that there was no retinal break. So there wasn't really anything uh, pushing us for immediate vitrectomy. And so you're hoping that he gets stabilized in the hospital, discharged, and then when are you wanting to see this patient back? Because this sounds like a long-term care issue for the retina service. For sure. Um, so since we had given him um, bevacizumab in his left eye and his systemic care was really the next most important step, we saw him back about a month later um, with some significant improvement. Well, I think that, you know, it's, it's fascinating because in, in this issue, there is an asymmetric Valsalva retinopathy from severe COVID-related pulmonary issues. Yes. So th we have these two cases that are incredibly asymmetric and incredibly unusual. So I, I think that's kind of fascinating. So for us, what would be your biggest take home? For me, what you've told me is to remind everyone to look at the second eye always. And when I'm with the residents and the fellows, sometimes I tell them, look at the second eye first. 
So your your judgment isn't clouded yet by being ultra focused on what's going on in in the eye that is the presenting eye. Any other pearls for for our readers? Well, you know that's such a good point. I I too like to look at the the second eye first uh, to get some little clues because it's like a mystery. Um, but yes, I feel like we're not just eye doctors. We have to remember that systemic disease is manifested uh, in the retina in particular. And so we're doctors first, uh, ophthalmologists next, and retina specialists third. Dr. Becker, thanks for, for really focusing us and for presenting such a wonderful case. And our readers will have the opportunity to see the entire case in JVRD this month. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tim. Thanks for tuning in to the JVRD Authors Forum. You can watch and listen to more episodes on the ASRS YouTube channel and on popular podcast directories, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Visit www.asrs.org forward slash JVRD forum on the ASRS website to learn more. See you soon.